All right, well, uh, hello everybody, and I'm very pleased to welcome uh, for this week's colloquium uh, Professor Olivier Guillon uh, of the College of Optical Sciences and Stewart Observatory, uh, and uh, NAOJ, the National Astronomy Observatory of Japan, uh, where, among other things, Olivier is the principal investigator for something called SKEX-AO, which I imagine we'll, we'll hear about today, uh, that is uh, an adaptive optic system of the extreme variety at the Subaru telescope on Mauna Kea that's designed to look for uh, planets around other stars. Uh, so Olivier is a, is a well-known figure to many of us, if not all of us. Uh, he's the uh, recipient of a Presidential Early Career Award as well as being a MacArthur genius uh, and a good friend. Uh, so I'm very pleased to welcome Olivier back to the college to tell us about searching for uh, life uh, amongst the stars. Thank you. Uh, it's always a great pleasure to talk about, uh, about this topic. Um, as you will see through my presentation, I will gradually go towards more challenging future things. And uh, the end of my presentation is uh, an extreme example of, of things that I probably will not live long enough uh, to see solved, and so it's great to have a lot of younger people uh, who can solve those problems. Um, this is a picture of the Subaru telescope at night, so Michael already introduced that I, I work uh, on at the Subaru telescope on a system, uh, an extremely system, which is developing a lot of the technologies we need uh, for the future generation of, of telescopes, of larger telescopes to actually image uh, Earth-like planets, habitable planets around other stars. So I'll talk uh, quite a bit about that. Uh, University of Arizona is deeply involved in one of these projects, the, the Giant Magellan Telescope. And so a lot of what we are doing is uh, essentially getting ready for those telescopes to be, uh, to be online and be ready to, de to deploy instrumentation that will um, um, look at habitable planets uh, with these telescopes. So habitable planet is um, it's actually fairly easy to define, uh, uh, potentially habitable planet at least. It's a planet that is in the habitable zone of a star. It's basically the, the, the zone where you could sustain liquid water on the surface of, of the planet. So um, it's essentially a purely a function of, uh, of the brightness of the star where that zone is. Uh, a, a very luminous star, the zone is, is, is further out. A low mass star, faint star, the zone is, is closer in. And, and that's important for, for a lot of what I'm going, going to talk about. Not surprisingly, our planet Earth is inside our sun's habitable zone. So we're fortunate that that is the case. You wouldn't have a colloquium if that wasn't the case. Uh, of course, what happens if you're slightly inside or outside the habitable zone is illustrated here. If you're inside, um, uh, this is the surface of Venus. Um, so Venus is actually very similar to Earth in, in composition, uh, in size. It's, it's about the same size as Earth. It's, it's a rocky planet. Uh, but it, it, it wasn't as fortunate as we are in terms of habitability. It's a little too close to the, um, uh, to, to, to the sun. Uh, so the, the oceans essentially boiled off. There is a very thick atmosphere, and it's also very warm. And so, so it's warm and dense, uh, almost 500 Celsius, uh, 90 atmosphere. Uh, this is a picture of, of, a, of a Russian probe that landed at the surface, and it took a picture of, of the surface. But given the temperature, it only survived about two hours before the electronics essentially uh, boiled off. Um, and and uh, if you go a little further out, uh, opposite situation, this is Mars. Uh, it's, it's both a little too far and also a little too small, so it couldn't retain a, an atmosphere that, that, that could have a very strong greenhouse effect. Uh, so we all know that Mars is a little bit too cold for us to, uh, um, to have a picnic. Um, and the other thing that matters in illustrated Mar Mars is, is the size. If you're too small, like the moon, moon is technically not a planet, but for this example, it doesn't matter. Uh, there's not enough gravity to retain an atmosphere. So you will, uh, even if you have an atmosphere uh, uh, soon after formation, it will gradually escape uh, to space. Uh, Earth is the right size. If you're much more massive than Earth, um, there's too much gravity. And during the formation phase of the planet, you basically uh, accumulate a very thick atmosphere. And, and you, you have a planet that then is mostly atmosphere. And, and uh, so it's a giant uh, uh, gas planet. And there's a lot of those that we know of. Um, so the exciting thing is that we're making steady progress, uh, and, and uh, this, this is the year of discovery. 
and every dot here is an exoplanet that has been discovered. And the vertical axis is mass. And uh, so we find more and more planets as years go by. And we find more interestingly, we find planets with lower and lower mass. Uh, it's, of course, it doesn't mean that planets are getting lighter. <laughs> it's just that we're getting better at seeing those. And there's probably a lot more of, of those small planets than there are big planets. And we're just starting to, uh, to be able to see them. Uh, the good thing about uh, the universe is there's a lot of opportunities for, for, uh, for exoplanets. There are about 300 billion stars in our galaxy. That's a large number. Um, and it's, it's really hard to comprehend. The, uh, the, uh, even pessimistic estimates uh, uh, suggest that about 10% of, of, of those stars have uh, a rocky planet in habitable zone. Um, so let's take this, this fairly conservative <laughs> estimate. That would mean there are 30 billion habitable planets in our galaxy alone. Uh, let's uh, assume we have 100 explorers that are uh, visiting each habitable planet for 10 seconds. Uh, that means that each one of us only has 300 million planets to explore. Uh, it would take 95 years to complete, complete the survey in our galaxy alone. So this is, this is you know, uh, converting numbers in time really gives us an idea of how big those numbers are. And that's just in our galaxy. Uh, there are about 200 billion galaxies in the observable universe. So the existence uh, of habitable planet, and in my opinion, the existence of life in the universe is not so much a question of... of are they, uh, do they exist? It's, it's, it's really a question of, of is it accessible? Is it, is, it, is it sufficiently nearby so that we can actually probe it? And this is what I'm gonna, going to talk about. Um, how do we identify exoplanets? By far the most successful approaches have been uh, uh, indirect. Uh, we don't actually catch the light from the planet. We don't take an image where we see uh, the planet. We uh, infer its existence from effect it has on starlight. Um, so um, uh, this, this little cartoon really uh, shows uh, uh, the dynamical aspect of it. When a planet is orbiting a star, uh, you know, we, we, we think that it's just the planet orbiting a star, but there's a little bit of the star orbiting the planet as well. So they both is essentially rotate around the center of mass of the two objects. Uh, and so by measuring the position or velocity of the star itself, we can find, we can, uh, find exoplanets. Uh, so one technique is to measure the position of the star on the sky. It's called astrometry. And for uh, an Earth or on the sun at about 30 light years, which is, which is really nearby for, as far as, as stars are concerned, uh, the angle is uh, uh, 0.3 microarcsecond. That's the thickness of a human hair at 20,000 miles. So if you, can, if you can resolve that angle and, 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 and measure it as a function of time, you're done. Sounds easy. Uh, the other thing you can do is, is uh, if you're viewing from this side, um, you, you will see the planet will uh, drag the star in a, in a periodic motion uh, towards and away from us. Um, and that, for an Earth around the sun, it's about 10 centimeters per second. And it does, through the Doppler effect, it changes the frequency of light uh, in one part in uh, 3 billion. So if you can measure the wavelength of absorption lines in the spectra of the star to that precision, you can also find uh, habitable planets. Um, and the most successful technique in terms of, of number of planets discovered is the one where uh, uh, you're viewing the system from, from this angle, and every time the planet goes around the star, it actually passes in front of the star, hiding a little bit of the light from the star. Um, um, so an Earth around a sun-like star is equivalent, you know, the, the photometric aspect of it is, 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 is basically going to dim the star by uh, 70 parts per million, it's equivalent uh, uh, to uh, watching a HD TV screen 70 miles away and having twel a little 12 by 12 pixel square go dark. Uh, so if you can do that again, uh, you're done. Uh, in our own solar system, uh, this is what it looks like, the, uh, a transit. So it's when this is an image of Venus uh, transiting uh, in front of the sun. Uh, a part of the sunlight is missing because Venus is in the way. Of course, we don't see it like this when we look at other stars. We just see the total integrated light. So we just see a little bit of a, of a dimming. Uh, an interesting thing you can see here is that uh, we can see that Venus has an atmosphere. There is a light that is being refracted by the atmosphere of Venus, that sunlight being refracted uh, from the atmosphere of Venus. Uh, the Kepler mission, the Kepler spacecraft, which I'm sure you've, you've heard the name, uh, is an, an, uh, has been uh, 
the, the single mission that has discovered the most planets through this uh, transit technique. Um, however, all these indirect detection techniques, uh, whether it's, it's, it's astrometry, measuring the position of a star, uh, uh, radial velocity, measuring its, its velocity, or transit, measuring its brightness, don't tell us much about the chemical composition of the planet. Uh, and if we want to uh, figure out if it has life, we need to go to the next step, which is direct imaging. Uh, we need to be able to um, measure the spectra of, of the planet itself so that we can see, uh, we can recognize water, oxygen, uh, and, and other interesting uh, molecular species. Uh, this is an example. Uh, this was actually done uh, uh, by uh, uh, Nick Wolf at the University of Arizona of a spectra uh, of, of the Earth, and it was cleverly done by actually looking at Earth shine. So this is, uh, this is the, uh, a very thin crescent of the moon. This is illuminated by sunlight. This is actually illuminated by Earth light. Uh, so if you take a spectra of this and divide it by that, you get the reflectance spectra of Earth. And this is what's uh, shown here. Uh, interesting things you can see is uh, you can see water, uh, but you also can see vegetation. There's a, right here, there's a, uh, uh, what's called a, a, a red edge. Plants actually get reflective in the very near infrared uh, so that they don't overheat in sunlight. And, and uh, so this particular uh, spectrum shows um, uh, one example of, of, of a biological signature. So we want to do that on, on other planets. But it's hard because uh, those other planets are uh, sitting very close to the star and they're also much fainter. So for people like me who build instruments to try to do that, there are really uh, two important parameters. And, and, and those are the angle between the planet and the star and the contrast the flux ratio between the two. Uh, so I, I plot them here. Um, every one of this circle is, um, is corresponds to a star within 30 parsec. There are 6,000 such stars. And here I, I, I plotted the location in this two-dimensional uh, space, angular separation and contrast, uh, that a habitable planet would, uh, uh, where a habitable planet would be. So uh, large separation is on, is on this side. And, uh, and, and challenging contrast is on this side. So there is an interesting gradient, a trade-off essentially, between separation and contrast. And it has to do with how bright the star is. Um, if you take a sun-like star, um, like uh, what, what astronomers call G-type stars, uh, the contrast is about 10 billion to one. Uh, for a habitable planet. And the separation is actually not too challenging. You know, big, modern big telescopes uh, can resolve this separation, but the contrast is extremely challenging. But if we think about a, a, a much fainter star, uh, what, what astronomers call M-type stars, the star is, because the star is much fainter, the habitable zone is very close to the star. So the, 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 the circles move this way. But because the star is faint, uh, and the planet still has to receive the same about one to one and a half kilowatt per square meter of, of energy for the star to be habitable, the contrast is actually much more favorable. Uh, so instead of talking about a 10 billion to one, we're talking about sometimes a million to one. And you may have heard, you probably have heard about this very exciting planet that was uh, uh, discovered around or the closest star to us, Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri is an M-type star. It's a red dwarf. And um, the dot, the circle, is this big red circle for Proxima Centauri. So it's, it's, uh, it's basically the contrast is a few, few million to one, um, which is interesting because we can start, this, those contrasts are accessible from the ground with large telescopes, but the angular separation is very small. Uh, uh, it's, it's a few tenths of milliarc second. So it does require a very large telescope to do that, and this is, uh, this is, this is what a lot of us are getting ready for, is this next generation of large ground-based telescopes which will have the angular resolution. They're big enough to actually uh, uh, move on this side of the graph. And uh, with adaptive optics and, and fancy detection uh, techniques that I will talk about, we can get to about this level of contrast, 10 to the, 10 to the 8. So there's a, this population of stars around which we can uh, see habitable planets. Uh, the sun-like stars, the main challenge is really the contrast. Um, and those we may have to go to space to do them uh, because the, the contrast is, is such that going through all atmospheres makes things uh, incredibly difficult. Uh, so there's a nice uh, uh, sort of complementarity between space and ground uh, efforts uh, uh, that we can see on this, on this graph. 
this, uh, I forgot to mention, but in this uh, graph, the size of the circle is, is, it encodes how far the star is to us. So the, the, the stars that are close to us, big circles. So this is Alpha Sun A and B, Proxima Centauri. This is Barnard star. So the big circles are stars that are close to us, and the small ones are stars that are uh, far away from us. So um, let's focus in on the nearest stars, um, the stars that are within five parsecs, about 16 light years. Um, and, and here I plot again, I, I, I show the distance. So this is uh, the closest one to us uh, is the Alpha Centauri system, Alpha Cent A and B and Proxima Centauri, uh, going all the way to five parsec. And here is the contrast, uh, the contrast that the instrument has to reach uh, to, to, to image uh, those targets. And we can see that a habitable planet around Proxima Centauri is, is at uh, uh, roughly 10 million to one. Uh, if we go a little further, there's a lot of targets uh, we can access. Um, this is where those targets are uh, in terms of uh, uh, southern versus northern hemisphere. So uh, um, if we want to target the, the, the best stars, which are close to us, we, uh, we really want to have facilities in both hemispheres. Uh, so, and, and it looks like that's, uh, that's going to happen. Uh, although, as you may know, the, the northern uh, extremely large telescope, the TMT is, is having some issues with its uh, sight right now, but let's, let's hope things go forward nicely. Uh, the best target is going to be Proxima Centauri, uh, so that we definitely want to have a southern telescope to access it, so the, the GMT is very well positioned to do that. Um, and, and then when we go a little further out, we have targets on, on, on both sides of the hemisphere. So we do want to, uh, to be able to take images of those, uh, of those stars, but what, what really is powerful is if we can both take images and, and either measure the radio velocity signal or the astrometric signal, because the, those two indirect measurements get us the mass. If we just have an image and we see a, 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 a spot, we actually, um, uh, we, we, get, we could get fooled in, in fairly major ways and, and, and be looking, for example, at a very large planet that's quite dark and think that it's an Earth. Uh, so we, we would like to, to be able to also measure the mass. Uh, and those are the two techniques which I described uh, uh, previously that, that, that do that. Uh, for example, the Proxima Centauri B planet was actually never imaged. It was discovered by the radio velocity technique. So we're, if we take an image, then we, um, we, oh, so we already actually know with some uncertainty due to the uh, inclination of the orbit, but we pretty much know the mass of that planet. It's about one and a half times the mass of the Earth. Um, and, 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 and this is an example of what we want. We really want to have images and, and one of those two, two techniques to, uh, so that we get the mass. Um, and those are the same uh, uh, planets, uh, hypothetical planet within 16 light years. And this is the amplitude of the signal in radio velocity. So if there was a habitable planet, how much it would move the star back and forth. This is one meter per second. This is 10 centimeter per second. Those lines are showing uh, sensitivity or current and very near future instruments, uh, depending on the, on the wavelength at which they operate. And this axis is the astrometric amplitude, is how much on the sky would the star move because of the planet. And again, there's a, an approximate uh, sensitivity for the upcoming generation of, of astrometric measurement. The nice thing in this graph is except for a few of those targets, uh, one of those two, two techniques has the sensitivity or will in the very near future to actually measure the mass uh, of the planet. So we're looking at um, a very favorable near future where we would have direct imaging with a combination of, of um, uh, ground-based telescopes for the low mass stars and space-based telescopes for, um, for sun-like stars. And we will also have masses with either astrometry or radio velocity of the target. So suddenly, we're uh, talking about uh, a real characterization of planets that could be quite similar to Earth. Uh, this, again, shows the, all those targets. Uh, this is distance and contrast. And those boxes um, uh, show uh, uh, the, the different techniques uh, uh, that can target them. There is. Uh, there is overlaps, uh, uh, the direct imaging with the ground uh, extremely large telescope is this light blue box. That's what I'm going to talk about most. Um, I talked about astrometry and radio velocity, which gets the mass. So basically, we have a way to get the mass of all of the planets we will be able to image, which is great. Uh, and we also uh, can do 
thermal imaging, imaging uh, not the reflected light, but the thermal emission from the planet uh, from the ground with large telescope. That's going to be better for the uh, hotter stars. So let's talk about imaging exoplanets. Um, we actually already have images of exoplanets, uh, but they're not, they're, they're quite different from the ones we want to image. So this is an example of an image of an exoplanet. This is a, a planet around the Beta Pictoris star. So the planet is uh, called Beta Pictoris B. And you can see it as a little white dot uh, in this image. And it's uh, conveniently, and, and it's not by chance, it's aligned with a disk. We, we actually knew this star had a disk uh, for quite some time. And more recently, a planet was imaged. Um, and that illustrates the fact that that the planetary system is more than just planets. There is, there is a lot of dust, especially in the young phases of the planetary system. And uh, uh, planets form from uh, dust and gas in disks. And, th and then after they form, uh, asteroids and, and planets collide and generate more dust. Uh, this dust in this system is probably mostly due to collisions. It's, it's, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, um, it's a little older than the, the dust that, that, that formed the planet. Um, another beautiful example of a system uh, which uh, this time has uh, four planets. Um, so um, uh, th the, the, those planets are uh, uh, from five to seven Jupiter masses, so they're quite big. They're not the kind of planets that, that, uh, that I'm going to talk about in the rest of the talk. Um, um, and the other thing that, uh, that, that, that you'll notice, this, this bar is 20 astronomical units. So it's 20 times the Sun-Earth distance. So they're actually, those planets are orbiting quite far away from the star. This is, this is the tip of the iceberg. This is what we can do right now easily because those planets are both quite far away from the star. And they're also quite luminous uh, because they're massive and they're still warm. So this is an image which does not measure the reflected light. It's actually measuring the thermal emission from the planets. Uh, because they're young and still cooling. Um, taking images of, of Earth-like planets is, is, is quite a bit harder. Uh, and this is, this, is, this, uh, this is a nice illustration of why it's harder. This is an image uh, that was taken by the Cassini spacecraft as it was flying uh, in the shadow of Saturn. So what, what you're looking at here is, 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 uh, is Saturn seen from uh, the other side of the sun. So the sun is actually behind, uh, and the rings uh, are, are, are showing scattered light. Um, there's a lot of interesting things in this image we could talk about. This light is actually light that is uh, uh, shining on the planet from the bright rings. So if you were floating <laughs> on a balloon <laughs> in the planet, you would see these huge rings, very bright, uh, illuminated by the sun. This is the light. This is illuminating the surface of the, of the planet. Um, we're here. This is Earth and Moon. So. If we zoom in, that's us. Um, so it's, it's hard because we're, we're talking, as this image shows, there's, there's about a 10 billion to 1 contrast between uh, our sun and, and, and our planet here. Conveniently, we had Saturn in the way, uh, but we can't do that around other stars. Uh, so we, uh, we have to actually uh, 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 find technological solutions to this very extreme uh, contrast problem. Uh, Thankfully, there are a, a range of facilities at, at various stages of, of development that are going to come online. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about what will happen in space, and I'll focus a little more about uh, what will happen on the ground. Um, this is the, the 30 meter telescope. This is the European Extremely Large Telescope, and this is the Giant Magellan Telescope. Those are the three major um, Extremely Large Telescope projects, um, and, and they have a very I think they will have uh, the first opportunity to image habitable planets. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, the one, of course, that we should pay attention to here at University of Arizona is the Giant Magellan Telescope, because uh, University of Arizona is, is a big part of this project. Uh, the, the, the mirrors are made in the mirror lab. So each of these uh, mirrors is, is uh, a, a little over 8 meter diameter. So it's, a, it's, it's a pretty big telescope. So what we need to do is what I do actually as a as my job is to design chronographs. They're optical systems that hide, block the light of the star, but let the light of the planet go through. Um, so I'll show you one I built. Uh, this is the easiest I ever built, uh, but it doesn't work well enough to see uh, exoplanets. And there are two problems with that. 
uh, uh, we need a smaller chronograph than just something that geometrically blocks starlight, uh, and we need a much bigger eye, uh, so we need large telescopes. Um, so if we, in, in sort of technical requirement, if we look at where, you know, I, I showed you those graphs, we could plot the planets, uh, expected location of planets in this uh, angular separation and contrast dimension. So we, we understand how well it needs to work. Uh, and, and so the requirements are here. Uh, it needs to work. Inner, uh, IWA's inner working angle is how close you can see the planet uh, to the star. And, it, and, and it, it needs to be near one diffraction limit. So we need to actually build a chronograph that can work uh, close to one diffraction limit. Uh, so get right to the first air ring, essentially. Uh, we need high throughput, of course, because planets are faint. Uh, we need at least 10 to the 5 contrast. Uh, because, um, and, and even that is not, we're not done when we get this contrast. We then we need to apply tricks uh, in image processing to recover the planet, which is yet another 10 or 100 times fainter than that. But that's the minimum requirement. Um, and, and one thing that uh, we didn't uh, think about uh, when we got started, but, but that is now quite obvious, is ELTs, extremely large telescopes, they're big enough that the star is partially resolved. It's not just a point, it's, it's actually a small disk. Uh, it's about a tenth of the diffraction limit of the telescope, uh, typically. And so that's, that are also factors in the design of the chronograph. So I, I showed you this and said, well, it's not smart enough. And the reason it's not smart enough is because at the contrast level we're talking about, uh, light does not, uh, uh, you know, we can't approximate light by light rays. Uh, it, we have to use wave optics. And so the problem with my thumb in front of the star, even if I scale that up, uh, is this, this is what would happen. You have waves coming into an island, and if your boat is anchored behind the island, you'd think, well, the water must be still, but it's not, because you get diffraction from the edges. So essentially, light would find a way, at the contrast level we're talking about, uh, around my thumb, to uh, basically create secondary waves that would uh, uh, throw light where, where I'm looking for the planet. And when we take an image with a perfect telescope in space, uh, we see this as, as airy rings. Uh, and that's the problem. So we, the chronographs have to factor in the, the, the wave-like wave -like nature, nature of light. Um, so um, there is, um, I, I recently designed a chronograph. I'm not going to go through too much of the detail, but it's, 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 it's here to show you that you can do this uh, for the GMT, uh, the Giant Magellan Telescope Pupil. And it uses, uh, and it meets those requirements. So, uh, it uses a trick which uh, which I developed with other people, where you um, you remove the sharp edges of the beam in the telescope by using aspheric optics, uh, and that has the advantage of of getting you a beam which still has all of the light of the telescope, uh, but it doesn't have those sharp edges that tend to create those airy rings, those those uh, oscillation. It's a little more complicated than just that because there is. Um, Chronographs have basically used various masks. Uh, so this is an optical diagram for that specific chronograph. It, so it uses this, this trick of aspheric optics to reshape the light of the telescope, but then it has a, a fancy focal plane mask, which is sitting on top of the star image uh, and acts on, on the uh, phase in, in a way that's optimized to cancel the light of the star uh, in, the, in the pupil. And then you put a mask to select only the areas that are dark here, which are uh, in the pupil, and, um, and, and the starlight is gone, a planet image would miss the mask. So all of the light from the planet would fall into this uh, dark area. So if you, if you select those dark areas, you've removed the light from the st uh, star, but you still have the light from the planet. So that mask that I just say, well, it's a fancy mask, uh, that's actually what it needs to look like. Uh, this is a, uh, it's computer optimized. Every one of those hexagons has a different thickness. And the computer has optimized the thickness of those hexagons. So the mutual interference between all of those hexagons uh, does the trick across the uh, wavelength range that, that we need to operate in. So this, this is a, a, a design for that specific chronograph architecture. And if, uh, when, I, when I used to show this, people said, well, there's no way you can make this because this is, uh, you know, this is like, this is going to be like a hundred micron big and, and you need crazy precision on these little hexagons. But as I'm sure you all know, uh, uh, um, lithography can do anything you want. So uh, we actually made a mask. Uh, this is one that 
uh, was made uh, slightly different geometry. We, did, we use sectors instead of hexagon. That's act an actual image of the mask, and we zoom in, and this is atomic force microscope, and we zoom in with a scanning electron microscope, um, and you can see that the actual profile follows very well uh, what we wanted to do, and uh, we tested it in the lab, and it works. Uh, so this is this looks like a total mess, but actually this all is starlight, but it's actually quite faint. It's it's about a hundred. It's about a uh, ten thousand to hundred times uh, uh, fainter than the original starlight. And this box is uh, so the star is actually gone, but it would be here. This box is where if there was a planet, you could see it uh, readily because it's very dark. Uh, <coughs> So uh, this is the design for the GMT. Uh, the GMT pupil is shown at the top left here with its uh, uh, seven segments, seven uh, mirrors. And this is tracing what happens to the light of a planet uh, through, all, through all those planes. So it basically, the light of a planet just goes through uh, all, all the way to the end. This is a log scale image where you would see the planet. But now I'm going to flip and show you what the starlight does. And basically, you can see that uh, everything's been optimized so that as you move through those planes, you basically cut down the light of the star. And at the end, with the same log scale, uh, there's just not much starlight left. Uh, the interesting thing, you know, if you look at this image, especially the top one, you can see that, that to actually check a chronograph works, you need to do a diffraction simulation. You need to, uh, it's wave optics, it's not ray tracing. And you can see all those diffraction effects that, uh, that happen. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the residual light as a function of wavelength at the top. And I mentioned that we need to pay attention to the fact that the star is actually not a point. It's resolved. This is for a point source, and this is for an actual star, which is 6% of the diffraction limit of the telescope, which is a typical for a nearby star with GMT. Yet there's actually a lot more light uh, when we take into account the star is not a point. But it's still OK. The contrast is still OK for this job, because the, the scale here the red is 10 to minus 6, and I said we needed to uh, get to 10 to minus 5. Uh, this is the, the throughput, so it checks out. Anyway, I wanted to show you this because uh, uh, you know, it shows that we know how to design chronographs for, uh, uh, for the GMT or any other large telescope. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, big new things, things that we're working on, big game changers in, ter in terms of the technologies that allow us to... Uh, uh, to get to very high contrast. And I, I list five here. Um, the first one is wavefront sensors are critical. So you need to basically measure the wavefront that um, enters the telescope. And it's changing all the time because of the atmosphere. And, and uh, there has been a huge progress in our ability to build very sensitive wavefront sensors. The new ones managed to exploit uh, the full diffraction limit of the telescope. And this represents a gain in sensitivity of about 40,000 times. Uh, compared to the current ones we're using. Um, so that's a huge gain, and, and that's already starting to happen on the sky. And the other thing we need, because at this precision level, the atmosphere is changing very fast, so we need very high-speed correction. Um, and when, we need high, when I mean high-speed, what really we mean is low latency. We need to actually manage to follow the evolution of the atmospheric turbulence with no latency. Uh, and we can do that by a combination of do, having high-speed hardware uh, and having f more uh, fancy control, predictive control that doesn't lag behind the signal. Uh, so again, we're actually making great progress on that. Um, when we work at the 10 to the minus 8 contrast, um, we, we actually notice that the atmosphere is, is very chromatic. The, the errors that we get are not achromatic in, in optical path length because the index of refraction has a, has a variation with wavelength because diffraction through the atmosphere uh, uh, is, is chromatic. Uh, so the new systems manage this by, having, by doing wavefront sensing and control at multiple wavelengths uh, so that they can, you know, the, the old system used to have a visible wavefront sensor and they would take images in the infrared. Uh, and, but that, because the, those, the wavefront is not exactly the same in the visible and infrared, that actually doesn't work well enough. So we're starting to do multiple wavelengths at the same time. Another uh, uh, breakthrough technology is fast speckle control. We actually start to be uh, um, able to look at the image, look at where residual light is, and cancel it actively in the camera. Uh, so I'll, I'll show you how that works. 
And the other thing where we're making great progress is um, our ability to calibrate what's left, the residuals. Uh, so we have an image where there is starlight left and there's planet light hiding in the image. And by using a range of techniques, some of them actually look at the, uh, the telemetry, the, the, the real-time information in the wavefront sensor. We're able to better uh, uh, calibrate what is this residual and therefore see the planet under it. Um, so we can actually combine those things and, 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 and run models, and, and those are grounded on, on actual performance of, of, of current ground-based ground AO systems and see, well, how well are we doing in terms of this contrast? So remember, recall that we need to get to about uh, 10 to the minus 5 contrast uh, uh, for the amount of light, and, and the planet is another 100 times fainter than that at 10 to the minus 7. Uh, this is what we would do with a 30-meter telescope and current technologies. Our detection limit, which is the, the yellow curve, would get us stuck at about uh, 10 to the minus 4. That's basically three orders of magnitudes away from the goal. Uh, so this is not just about building a big telescope, taking the old technologies and putting them on a big telescope. We need more than that. Uh, the, the two other thick curves, the red one is the, the total amount of light that's left. Uh, so we, we can detect things that are fainter than the total amount of light through calibration. And the blue curve is the photon noise limit. So you can see that the problem is not photon noise. It's really our, it's, it's what we call speckles. It's those things that look like planets that are left in the image that we can't calibrate very well. Um, but we can start to, if, to look at what happens if we actually change uh, to, to, more modern, to more modern technology. So the first thing we can do is use a more efficient wavefront sensor. Everything drops. There's less light. So uh, we gain a better factor 10, uh, which is not enough yet, but that's, that's great. And then uh, um, the last trick we use is this ability to do the, um, uh, some of us call it the, the afterburner, the active correction from the focal plane where we see those speckles, we actually actively cancel them. And I'll show you how that works. And then we drop to actually a detection limit, which is 10 to minus 8, 10 times better than we need. So um, we have the tools. Uh, we have the technologies. Uh, we just need to uh, deploy them and test them. Um, another thing that I didn't even factor in is, um, is predictive control. Um, and uh, my group has been working on a, on a particular flavor of it. I, uh, I call it what dumb people do with fast computers. Uh, it's basically uh, taking all of your telemetry, putting it in a very fast uh, computer, and asking it to figure out what are the temporal spatial relationship in that data set. And then once you've figured it out, you apply it in real time to predict uh, the turbulence uh, a few steps ahead. Uh, and the nice thing is that computers are becoming fast enough that you can do that now. So we can afford to be dumb and, and let the computers figure things out. Um, those are examples of, of, of uh, results from predictive control. Uh, I'll just uh, uh, outline on the top graph, the red curve is the actual, uh, this is for tip, this is for pointing, the actual uh, pointing, the um, the green is what you measure. So you have a sensor that's lagging behind, and it's noisy. So if you just took the green and say, oh, let's go there because that's what we measure, you would do very poorly. Uh, and, and, and the blue is actually what the predictive model tells you from the green points uh, where you're at. So uh, this really illustrates how powerful this, uh, these approaches can be. It can also uh, lock on uh, transient events, like uh, if... if if someone is kicking the telescope every once in a while, this will learn about it and, and will deal with it. Um, and so we, we, we run actual uh, models of, of how that works on, on realistic atmosphere. Uh, and this is, uh, so without predictive control, you've got, this is a residual image after the coronagraph. Uh, you have this light that's left and it's not smooth. Uh, it's, it's, it, it has a lot of speckles that are left. Uh, that's, there are basically ghosts of actual speckles, but because the system is lagging behind, it tends to leave those speckles behind, and they look like planets. Um, but when you apply this, this uh, predictive control technique, uh, the scale is different here. Uh, it gets a lot fainter, and it's also getting a lot smoother, because all those things that stuck around for a while, they're the ones that predictive controllers are very good at removing. So 
when we plug this into, uh, uh, into our model, we find that um, we basically drop the contrast by about a factor of 1,000 uh, if we apply this, these tricks. Uh, about a factor of 100 in raw contrast amount of light and another factor of 10 on top of that in, in calibration because the residue is, is better behaved. And the last uh, tricks that we use after we do all this is differential detection. Um, now we, so we've got a situation, there's some light left, some starlight left, and there's a planet hiding in there, probably 10 to 100 times fainter. What, do we, what tricks can we use to actually figure out what is starlight and what is planet light? Well, a lot of people have been uh, working recently on high resolution, spectral resolution template matching. Let's say you're trying to find oxygen on a planet. If you have a high resolution spectrograph, oxygen has very narrow sets of lines, of absorption lines, that you could look for. And the star has none of that. So you could, uh, uh, you could differentially uh, find planet light because it has those spectral features and starlight doesn't. Uh, so that's a very promising approach. Another one is coherent differential imaging. The planet, um, so all of the residual starlight is actually coherent with the, pla with, with the star itself because it's starlight. So those speckles that are left, they would interfere with starlight if you threw starlight at it. The planet does not. It's incoherent. So you can use this as a discriminator. And my next slide will show you how that works. Uh, uh, and there's a variant of that, uh, which, uh, which uh, I'll probably skip that because it's, it's somewhat right. I'll, I'll just show you this coherent uh, business. Uh, so this is a typical case where you have um, you know, leftover starlight, and then there's a planet hiding in there, but you see all these speckles. And they're actually starlight. They're basically due to residual wavefront errors. Uh, but what you can do is say, well, let's write this pattern. Let's add this error in the beam. And we can just do that with a deformable mirror. This has been specifically computed so that when you add this pattern into the beam, into the phase of the beam, it throws light in this rectangle. It throws starlight in this rectangle. It's like defocusing your telescope throws additional light in your image. Here it's not a defocus, it's a specifically computed pattern to throw a nice well-behaved rectangle of starlight. And you can shift the phase of this pattern, which is what happens here, so that the complex amplitude of that light is actually uh, scanning in phase. So it's the same amplitude, but it, the phase is changing. And if you go through this sequence and you apply these errors, the speckle field looks a little different every time you apply this error. But because you know exactly what errors you applied, you know what you added in complex amplitude to this image, if you do this fast enough and you don't have let the speckles change during that process, you can then take those five images, put them in a computer, and ask the computer to solve what was the starlight and what was the planet light in there, and this is how it works. This is the starlight and this is the planet light. So it, it recovers the planet, which, w which was invisible uh, in the original image. And this technique is, is usually paired with a, a very closely related technique, is, which is that once you have this map, you know exactly what starlight is, not just in intensity, but in phase. You could ask your system to create a pattern which cancels this, because it's coherent with starlight. You could say, oh, I'm going to throw additional starlight that will cancel this and, and bring it to zero. And uh, this is what we do. This is actually a real image where we did that in the lab. Uh, you see there is residual starlight here. Some of it is actually due to the spiders of the telescope. And uh, we basically ask the computer uh, to cancel that by changing the shape of the beam uh, to remove that light. And it, it works. It gets darker here. And, uh, so this is, a, this is a brand new technique that we're starting to apply on Sky. I'll skip this. this is, so this is what the full system that combines a lot of these tricks uh, would look like. Uh, it has, it's a lot more complicated in some ways than a, a conventional adaptive optic system because it has, a lot of, it has several wavefront sensors running at different speed, different wavelength. Uh, and so a lot of it, you know, a lot of what I describe is we, we understand those tools, we have the technology, but it's really about putting this together as a system. Uh, and and what, uh, what we need to do, what, what some of us are doing right now, is, um, is putting this together on, as a system on current telescopes, uh, 5 to 10 meter uh, class telescopes, so that we learn what works, what doesn't, how to, uh, how to combine those things, how to write the detection algorithm. And there are two systems 
uh, that, that I'm involved in that are, are extremely relevant to this. There's a Skexel system on the Subaru telescope, which is built to be a, essentially a technology development platform for all those uh, uh, concepts. And there is a, a, a system uh, which is starting now, which is on the Magellan uh, telescope, uh, which plays a similar role. Uh, and those are really prototypes to uh, uh, ELT systems. Um, so I have a few slides on the Subaru system. That's what it looks like. It's pretty boring. It looks like any instrument. Uh, it's in there it's, it's, it's literally a black box. Uh, actually, it's few black boxes. Um, it's got three optical benches here. Believe it or not, there is a fourth one slapped on the side in the back. And there is two other ones that are fiber fed. So it's got a lot of, uh, lot of optics. Um, so that's where all of those techniques that I described are, are implemented. And, if you, uh, and, and our goal, uh, because we do this at the Subaru Telescope, which is a partner on the TMT, is, is to actually prototype an instrument for the 30 meter telescope. And uh, if you look at the lower optical bench, so that one here, and uh, this is what it has. So um, I'm not going to go through the detail, but it fits multiple instruments simultaneously. The interesting thing with this instrument is everything is small uh, because essentially we don't need field of view. We're looking for a planet right next to a star, so we don't need uh, uh, big optics. Everything is small. Uh, the biggest beam size is right here, and it's 18 millimeter. So we take a 8 meter telescope and we uh, shrink it to a 18 millimeter beam, and we do all these horrible things to it. Um, uh, that's, I'm sure that's what the photons, the starlight photons, especially feel like. Um, so this, this, if you look at the real hardware, uh, it's very confusing. Uh, it's, it's a lot of optics, but everything's small. So it, 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 it has a very di different feel from, from a lot of big instruments. And the point I'm making here is that when, when your field of view is essentially zero, um, the instrument size has nothing to do with the telescope size. So you could take this instrument and put it behind a 30 meter telescope and it would not have to change. You change a few masks and coupling optics, but uh, it's all about what you do to the light. It's a zero field of view instrument. Uh, you can pack a lot of things uh, into a small volumes. Um, and this is, what, so this is certainly what we did with this instrument. Uh, some of the highlight, uh, the chronograph optics, the optics that remove the starlight are in, uh, in this space of the, of the lower optical band, of the lower optical bench. Uh, this is a different mirror which has 2,000 elements. So there's a beam that's 18 millimeter that bounces on this mirror, and it has 2,000 uh, sort of push-pull little actuators, so we can shape very precisely the the, the light. Um, and uh, so this is another picture of the different mirror. Uh, so as I mentioned, we use chronography, uh, fast wavefront sensing. Uh, we use infrared wavefront sensing as well, and we use this uh, speckle control. Uh, trick. The wavefront control architecture looks a lot like the ideal diagram I showed you. It's got multiple wavefront sensors. Uh, some of them running quite fast. The fastest one runs at about three and a half kilohertz. Uh, so that actually, a few years ago, uh, if you said, oh, I'm going to build a 3.5 kilohertz AO system that has, uh, this system has 14,000 sensors and 2,000 actuators, people say, there's no computer that can uh, uh, do this. I'm very thankful uh, to uh, people who waste time playing video games, and uh, high-speed traders, uh, because uh, then we, you can just buy uh, hardware that will, uh, right now, that, that will do this. So we use GPUs uh, to do the computation. We have, uh, our, our system is about 30,000 cores, 30,000 30, GPU cores in uh, nine uh, GPU boards to do the, the job. and. Uh, uh, this is what it does on sky. This looks boring if, if you're not an astronomer, but if you're an astronomer, it's exciting. This is, a, this is an image through the telescope in the near infrared in H-band of a star. Uh, and the boring part is what's exciting to us. Uh, you don't see a lot of turbulence here. It's been cleaned very nicely. Uh, so this is a great starting point for all the tricks we want to use then. The, 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 the control of the speckles, the modulation of the speckles, the chronograph. Um, this is the same image in the visible. You can see the uh, airy ring and the uh, diffraction emit, but most of what we do is at this wavelength. This is not just adaptive optics like we used to do it, where we just wanted to have the image no bigger than, than the PSF core. Here, not only 
it's diffraction limited, but um, more importantly for what we try to do, everything is very stable here, uh, which is key to, to find planets. Um, this is, so one of our instruments is um, uh, what's called an integral field spectrograph. We, we, it, it, it measures the intensity, but as a function of wavelength. And I'm showing you this image of Neptune uh, through this instrument, it's called CARIS, to illustrate the fact that we really don't have a very big field of view. Neptune is, is a tiny planet. It's about two arcs second in the sky. Uh, that means uh, just with a telescope, if you look through a telescope with your eye, it takes a very still night to even see that it's not a star. And it doesn't fit in our field of view. Uh, so this is Neptune, and it, it overfills the field of view. It, it, it doesn't fit. Uh, but of course, we're not interested in looking at Neptune. We want to look at other Neptunes. <laughs> from other stars. So this is the kind of data you get. Um, the interesting thing is if you scan through wavelength, everything gets bigger. The diffraction limit gets bigger. So this is why in this video you see everything moving out. I'm going to play it again. Uh, everything moving out, except this thing is not moving out. Right, there's something here that's not moving out. So that's a real companion. So that's one way, one trick we can use to actually post-process these images to find a planet. It turns out it's not a planet, it's a brown dwarf. It's a, it's a failed star, uh, but it's, it's not small enough to be a planet. Um, this is a, another trick we have to play. Is, uh, the atmosphere is chromatic, uh, so we get atmospheric dispersion. Uh, not, not all the wavelengths line up. Uh, so we have this closed-loop system that looks at uh, the speckles and, and where they're pointing at compared to the, uh, to the core of the PSF. And, and, and there's a loop that closes around it to keep things uh, perfectly uh, 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 radially centered, which, which we do by rotating uh, chromatic prisms uh, to align all the wavelength. Um, and then the most important one is this trick. Um, so it's very easy to make things worse in a way we understand. This is an image where we have done so. Uh, this is a, the, the, the star is here, but we've, we've actually put a sine wave pattern on the beam with our deformed mirror and it creates ghosts image of the star. And we can put as many of them as we want simultaneously by adding sine waves onto the beam. It's just a property of the Fourier transform. So we know how to make things worse in a specific way. So once, if, but the, the way we use this is if we know if we have speckles and we've measured what complex amplitude they have, we can use this trick to put anti-speckles, so speckles that are exactly the opposite complex amplitude that will kill the ones that, we, uh, that are annoying us. And so we do this on sky. And uh, I'll just show you the image that blinks. This is before and after. So you can see the difference. We actually removed light on this side uh, by applying this pattern. The only problem with this, uh, I'm showing you data here that's uh, on a super bright star because we don't have very, very good camera uh, to do the, the sensitive camera that can do this fast enough. So we're um, uh, in this field, we're investing a lot on, on high-speed uh, sensitive photon counting camera. So this is an example of one of the technologies. It's a, it's a near infrared photon counting camera. Uh, and we're collaborating with the University of Hawaii on this project. Uh, this is another example. Um, this is an even more exotic camera. It's a photon counting near infrared camera where every photon that hits the detector, you actually get its wavelength as well. Uh, and this, all of you, what you see is a, is a fridge essentially that, that because this operates at, a, at 100, 100 millikelvin. Um, and here is an, yet another uh, camera technology. So we're, we're friends with a lot of people who develop cameras. Um, so, um, uh, actually, I'll, I'll go to this slide. We have all these techniques that I've described that are really rapidly moving from paper concepts uh, to on-sky operation, and we're starting to uh, do the system integration. So we are, re so we will be ready uh, when the, the extremely large telescopes uh, will be deployed in um, in ten ten ish years. Uh, so this is my conclusion slide on 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 the chronograph detection of exoplanets. I'm very optimistic that. Uh, we'll be able to, to
to, to image and characterize habitable planets uh, very soon after those uh, large telescopes get deployed. Um, and um, I have three more slides on something completely different. Uh, so everything I presented is about remote sensing, but what if we could travel to those exoplanets? Um, so it's hard. Uh, you, a lot of people have looked at this. Uh, there were uh, several studies, um, and, and, and they all face the problem of, of propulsion. How do you propel something to travel uh, to other stars? This is one of the crazy example concept. Uh, this is actually a, a, a demo of, of a concept where uh, you, you drop bombs behind your spacecraft, and as they explode, they, they uh, propel your spacecraft. So they actually got pretty far along. And usually when you see this, this is a bad sign. Uh, but, but in this case, that's what they're after. Um, and and the, so this is a demo with conventional explosives, but the real concept was to use nuclear bombs that would be uh, dropped uh, behind this. And this is called a pusher. Uh, and there is a shock absorbers here. And there's a reservoir of nuclear bombs, so you, you drop them, and, and there you go. <laughs> so, uh, you know, extreme problems call from extreme solutions. But so, uh, this is 20-ish this is years ago, right? I think you get the idea, it keeps going. Uh, <laughs> So now we're starting to actually revisit this, and this is, this is an effort that uh, has been uh, uh, revived by the, um, the, the breakthrough initiatives, um, a privately funded uh, uh, effort. And, and so now, if we, if we look at this with current technology, there are, there are th things have changed tremendously. So we're not thinking of, of, of dropping nuclear bombs behind the spacecraft anymore. Um, you know, we can build very small spacecrafts now. We can build, you know, and, and this is just going to keep going. We're, we'll be able to um, just look at your cell phone. Uh, you know, there's actually, you can build spacecraft that are even lighter than that. Um, and so we can think of very small. Uh, so I, I should mention, I'm not talking about sending people. We're just sending hardware uh, to take pictures. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we've, uh, we've advanced in laser. We can think of laser propulsion, where you have a ground-based laser pushing your spacecraft, so you don't have to carry your fuel. Uh, so those are the two big new uh, uh, sort of directions for uh, looking at this project. So the, the Starshot project is, 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 is looking at this. The goal is, about, uh, is, is to reach a speed which is about 20% the speed of light. Um, the concept is you accelerate a reflective cell for a few minutes while it's still close enough to you so that you can focus the laser. Uh, so you're talking about acceleration of, 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 of more than 10,000 G. Um, then it travels for, it depends where you go, but uh, if you go to uh, near a star, it's about 20 years. And you don't, you, it's a flyby. You don't try to decelerate, which, is, which would be very hard. So you just, just push it, let it go. And it, uh, it goes for 20 years, and, and then it just flies by the planet, that you, and you take a few images. Um, the, the, the interesting thing is most of your investment is going to be on the laser array that pushes. Uh, there's really not much to the spacecraft itself. It's, it's like we call it a nanocraft. So you, can, you would launch many of them. You, just, you could launch one a week or one a day. Um, so it's, 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 it's still very difficult. There's a, a very significant uh, technology challenge. Uh, the, the, the power you need is uh, multiple tens of, of gigawatt to push this. So it's a pretty powerful laser. Uh, and it's about a kilometer wide in terms of, so it's an array of telescopes that are co-phased. <clears throat> um, you need to avoid burning your cell. Uh, so you have these gigawatts of power uh, falling on a small area. The coating needs to be very reflective. Uh, the sail needs to be stable. Uh, you don't want it to start spinning. Uh, you also have to worry about abrasion from uh, interstellar dust. When you travel at that speed, it doesn't take much to, to do a lot of damage. Uh, you need to build things to resist very high uh, acceleration, uh, which is not too much of a problem for the electronics. It's a little more tricky for the camera. You need a good battery that will last 20 years and not weigh much. Uh, there are some navigation challenges. Uh, so the idea is you can, you can do a little bit of course correction with photon thrusters, but you also need to know how to do those, where to go. Uh, communication, 
is it also challenging. Um, uh, how do you transfer the image back once you arrive? Uh, there is a significant power problem uh, that uh, you're, you're quite far away, so you either need a lot of power or you need to very efficiently beam the data optically to uh, down to Earth. So the next step in this project is to um, is to do concept studies on, on, on key challenging aspects to really understand uh, understand them better, understand what are the options, and also to do a ground demo in a vacuum pipe um, to go f uh, nominally at about 100 kilometers per second to go faster, essentially, that chemical propulsion can. Uh, so I'm part of a group of people that's uh, thinking about that, and we're actually not solving these problems. We're just writing them down, and the idea is to write, uh, and that already keeps us busy. <laughs> Uh, but the idea is to basically uh, uh, come up with uh, uh, requests for proposals that uh, industry and universities can apply for, uh, for um, so that we can we can understand how, how really how challenging this problem is. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm done, and uh, this is by far the most challenging thing I've ever worked on. <laughs> Thank you.